<laughs> the topic for today, of course, is continuing in our study on apologetics, and today we're going to give you a little bit of a survey of pre-Socratic pre -pre -Socratic philosophy uh, as the basis for introduction to the presuppositional apologetic method. Now, it's really impossible to say everything that has to be said about the pre-Socratics in the few minutes I'm going to give it. So we're just going to use a couple of examples to show what I've talked about in previous lessons about uh, theories of motion, the movement of the universe, the ordering of things. Because one of the great mistakes in understanding presuppositionalism is that, that there is some attempt by the apologist to, uh, pr to prove or affirmatively posit an existence of God. Because that's, that's not what we're trying to do. There is no way for any logical proof to be put forward that says this proves God that can stand on its own. Does that make sense? There's no, there's no scaffolding out there that exists beforehand that we can just find and say, oh, you can hang the apple of belief in God from that scaffolding. Right? There are no other neutral ideas that the existence of God can be proved by, uh, which is hard to reconcile. So we're going to start with the pre-Socratics. I'm going to go through Tertullian, Augustine, and Anselm, kind of show how Anselm is the or origin of really Western Anglican philosophy. I have some, some fun books here, but let's first establish some uh, philosoph philosophical history. So if you were to think about the post-Socratics, so if you were to say uh, the beginning of modern Greek, ancient Greek, or however you want to say it, Greek philosophy, you have uh, Socrates, uh, or as our friends from Bill and Ted say, Socrates, Right? The excellent adventure. So. <laughs> no. uh, but Socrates represents a shift in Greek thinking. So you didn't ever ask or question, what was Greek philosophy like before Socrates, and what does he give uh, Western culture, Hellenistic philosophy that's not there before? <coughs> of course, we know Socrates had a disciple. His disciple's name was Plato. Uh, Plato is important. We're going to talk a little bit later about how Plato's influence is really seen in the work of St. Augustine. Uh, sometimes you'll see in philosophical language the phrase neo attached between an guy because it's like not exactly the same thing, but it uses some of the philosophical underpinnings, the presuppositions or assumptions of that worldview to build its ideas. Uh, and Plato has a little disciple, his name is important too. That's Aristotle. Aristotle's important. Um, and got an E there. Aristotle. Uh, at, the, at the end of this, I'm going to draw a little graph to talk about the difference between uh, realism uh, and then the other views given to us by Plato and Aristotle for understanding the way in which the forms of the universe exist in reality or outside of reality, in our mind and outside of our minds. So hold on to these guys here. Uh, the other thing to remember about these is the context of their history. So Aristotle had a great disciple. His name was... Alexander, or Alexandros. He was Alexander the Great. Um, and because of Alexander the Great, uh, the Greek philosophy and the Greek language spreads all over uh, basically Europe. So this great king of Macedon conquers the world, introduces Hellenism, and down to even the Jews, translate their scripture from Hebrew into Greek, so that so Jesus speaks in Greek, and Paul speaks in Greek. And so not only is there a common language, there's a common philosophical understanding. And as we discussed last time, <clears throat> that this kind of history of, of Aristotle will be held in the early church, but Plato will, will find a resurgence down into Tertullian in the second century, and then later with Aristotle. But when the Muslims reintroduce philosophy of Aristotle, Mr. Thomas Aquinas will pick up Aristotle. So that's basically what we've covered so far, right? So we've covered those ideas. So we're going to go more into those. But those pre-Socratics uh, are important. And I have <coughs> a little question for you. Anybody know the story of the tortoise and the hare? <laughs> tortoise and the hare, of course. Now, the tortoise and the hare are helpful. But there's an ancient version of the tortoise and the hare called Achilles and the tortoise. Did you ever study that? <laughs> so Zeno, pre-Socratic. So before you know, ancient Greek philosophers, so think of um, Heraclitus and, and these guys, 
Zeno had a, an idea to question how we know what we know. And it used a number of paradoxes, but the, the one that I think is most helpful to understanding is Achilles and the tortoise. Uh, because there are assumptions <coughs> we make about the reality we live in that we don't have a right to make. So for example, in the story of the tortoise and the hare, we all know the answer to Aesop's fable, who wins the tortoise. The tortoise wins because of some ethical struggle with the map. He's a lazy hare, or he takes too many breaks, or, or something, right? But in your natural perception, if you take a rabbit and you put blinders on him, little bunny blinders, <coughs> uh, and you stick him in a track, and you take a tortoise and you stick him in a track, and nothing interrupts their natural progress, of course the rabbit's going to win, right? The hare is faster, he's going to move quicker, the tortoise is slower, he's going to lose. Uh, so say you did that over 10 meters, rabbit or hare versus tortoise, hare wins every time. Naturally, you would think that. Right? So Zeno has a, a, another idea. He says Achilles, everybody knows who Achilles is, the mythical hero of the Greek world. Achilles, famous for the wound, the arrow wound in his heel, right? Achilles' heel, where we get the Achilles tendon in our modern physiology. But Achilles versus the tortoise is a helpful way for understanding. Whoops. But uh, Achilles versus the tortoise is a helpful way of understanding that what we think is true through natural observation might not be philosophically true. So who would win between the great warrior and athlete Achilles and tortoise? Naturally, Achilles. So uh, Zeno introduces this idea. He says, we're going to have a race between uh, the turtle, the tortoise, and Achilles. And... He doesn't say these numbers, but we're going to put some numbers on here just to make it easier because it's harder when he says a certain distance, etc. But say the race is 100 meters, a short little race, 100 meters. The tortoise challenges Achilles to the race, and he says, uh, I'll, try, I'll race you 100 meters. The only thing is, because you're faster than me, you're going to give me a 50 meter head start. 50 meter head start. It's 50 meters. Some of you are familiar with this paradox before. You're going to think of the paradox of infinity. If you've ever done any higher math, you're going to pay attention and recognize this immediately. So on the top, we got Mr. Achilles. On the bottom, we got Mr. Turtle. Tortoise. I don't know if there's a big difference between that, right? Both of them are slow enough for this analogy. Although, if maybe a turtle could sway, it would be a little bit different. But in this illustration, they're both running. So the rule is, the tortoise gets a head start. So Achilles can't start until he gets to the halfway point. And Achilles only wins if he overtakes the tortoise. So looking at this, what's the natural explanation? Who is going to win? Well, if the tortoise gets here and Achilles is running at 12 miles per hour, he's obviously going to overtake him again because the tortoise goes 0.5 miles per hour. But Zeno says the tortoise wins every time. And it's impossible for the Achilles to win. How? So he explains it like this. He says, the tortoise gets the halfway. Right there, it gets the halfway. And then here comes Achilles. He catches up. Now he's at the halfway point. But when Achilles gets to the halfway point, Zeno asks, is the tortoise still there? The answer is, no, because the tortoise has made some progress since he's come there. So let's say that he's gone another 25. So now we're at 75 meters. Okay. So Achilles keeps going. He gets to the 75 point. Okay. Tortoise is there at 75 point. I mean, sorry, Achilles is there at the 75 point. But since Achilles went from 50 to 75, the tortoise has moved too. So the tortoise is no longer at 75. The tortoise has moved, maybe still going slow. He's gone you know, halfway that distance there. So Achilles has to keep going. But by the time he gets to where the turtle was, the turtle is no longer there, right? <laughs> so Achilles doesn't catch up with him. And so this idea, does this make sense? Keeps going on and on and on an infinite number of times, so that Achilles, every time he gets to the place where the tortoise was, the tortoise is no longer there. So even though the tortoise is going slow, thinking in this uh, you know, mathematical way, he never quite catches the tortoise. But naturally, you know that's not true, of course. Achilles is going to win every time. But how do you prove what you know to be true? Another way to explain this uh, is if you take your hands 
and say, clap your hands, but you have to clap them at a speed of reducing them by half every time, right? Do your hands ever touch? The answer is no, your hands actually never do touch, because eventually you'll get to these tiny little pieces of fractions of millimeters that, though you can't control the muscles in them, but if you just divide by half, they'll never quite touch. Uh, so the paradox there was not how do you, whose fact, Achilles or turtle, which one's true, which one's going to win, it's how do you account for how motion is perceived by the senses. So that, that's a fun little paradox, and uh, some mathematicians pretend that they have figured it out. Uh, not quite, but uh, that's, a, that's a fun one in the pre-Socratic, but it, it offers a, a problem in the Greek or Hellenistic worldview of how do you account for motion or movement uh, inside the world. So I have a, a quote here from Mr. Gordon Clark. Uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, speaking on, on uh, Aristotle, he says, the climax of antiquity's study of motion is found in Aristotle. Before the more intricate parts of his theory are examined, <clears throat> Uh, Aristotle argues that if everything were always changing, nothing would exist and knowledge would be impossible. Therefore, he concludes, something must exist that does not change. Something must exist that does not change. And so, these early math problems were dealing not with the idea of observation of matter, but the idea of infinity and eternity and finitude and measuring of those things. So, I don't know how helpful it is to spend too much time on this, but basically you have, you're left with an assumption about the nature of the universe we live in. Is it eternal? And if it is eternal, how do you account for change in eternity? And if it is finite, how do you account for the origin of that? So uh, the Christian solution to these pre-Socratic and Aristotelian dilemmas um, was ex nihilo creation. Ex nihilo creation. So there's an eternal, the unmoved mover, the uncreated creator, the idea of God, the uh, has to be supposed or assumed for anything else to be <coughs> comprehensible. And then the world that we live in must be a product outside of the eternal, made by the eternal, for anything to make sense. So keep in mind those philosophical ideas as we go into some of the ideas here. Um, and so to do that, I have a quotation to begin with, with our doctrine of creation, starting with Tertullian. So some of you are familiar with Tertullian. He's writing 180, 190 AD, so second, end of second century, important figure, Tertullian, uh, from the city of Carthage. Um, and he writes on the doctrine of creation this. He says, the object of our worship is one God, who by the word of his command, by the reason of his plan, and by the strength of his power, has brought forth from nothing the whole construction of elements, bodies, and spirits for the glory of his majesty, which is why the Greeks have bestowed upon the, word, uh, the world the name cosmos. So Tertullian, very early on in Christian history, is, is explaining that when Christ comes, that the solution to all of the problems of the pre-Socratics and the so uh, so Socratic philosophers are actually solved in this idea. And this is basically where our Christian philosophers are going to go to the Greeks, like uh, St. Paul at Mars Hill, go to the Greeks and explain the answers that you are seeking in your philosophy are actually found in the self-authenticating, self-revealing uh, God of the Hebrew Scripture. So that's uh, the predicate of this. Now, from in our, our Christian history, right, we have, of course, our Bible, which is the canon of it, is closed by AD 70. Without that, we have all of our books all written out and established. Uh, but then we have our early church fathers who begin to explain uh, how exactly the scripture comes to work in our early world. So I mentioned Tertullian, and I'm just putting a couple names. This is not uh, an exa exhaustive uh, list of them, but I'm trying to build a, a case this morning to show you that there is a historic basis for the philosophical methodology we call presuppositionalism, 
that's not just the imagination of Greg Bonson or Cornelius Van Til or Hume Dewey Berry or some Dutch philosopher. This isn't something made up in reaction to Hegel or made up in reaction to uh, modern, postmodern philosophy. This is the historic Christian view of things. So we read from Tertullian that ex nihilo creation is the basis for philosophy. God, who is eternal, creates a creation that reflects his image, and that's he's made everything, spirit and physical. That there is nothing in the physical or spiritual that is a part of God, because God is eternal. But all those things that exist in matter or spirit were created by God. That solves a lot of the <coughs> Greek philosophy problems. But then we get to our buddy, Agni, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo. Uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, this is a, just a little bit of time between these guys, a couple centuries. But Augustine would be closely related to this Platonic philosophy. He was formerly a Manichaean, converts, <coughs> he's baptized by St. Ambrose. Good pedigree to have. Ambrose is a great uh, philosopher and thinker in the church. Uh, but Augustine is the origin of the phrase that I believe that I might understand, or I have faith that I might understand. Those originally are from Augustine's writing, that the source of knowledge starts with faith in God, that, that knowledge and logic and the tools of uh, intelligibility are predicated on the idea of faith, which, again, is really difficult, difficult for us to, to have an idea with. But Augustine, why he's borrowing from Plato, and we have to go over this to make sense of the main topic today, which is uh, Anselm, is Plato's theory of forms. Forms. You can't understand uh, Anselm's argument, which we're going to go over, the ontological argument, without understanding Plato's idea of forms. So, imagine there are two types of world. Right? There's the world that's real, right? that has matter, but it's noticeable to our senses. Like, empirically, it can be studied. It has taste, it has texture, it has substance, it has atoms, it has all these things that are about it, whether liquid or air, whatever it is. Those are the real world. But Plato said that there's another world where the perfect version of these things exist, that's the world of the forms. So you can look at uh, Mr. Joe Hall's future red Porsche Boxster, right? And he's going to go to the dealership and he's going to say it's going to be cherry red. And he has an idea, uh, this cherry red, he goes, gets the keys, gets the car, gets the car. He's driving that red Porsche Boxster. But there is... Uh, Red that exists because of the pigment put on top of the car. But there's also another type of red that exists outside of the real world. There's the form of red. I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. That there is an ideal called red that exists whether or not red exists in this world. If every red thing was annihilated. And that's the same thing true of every concept according to Plato. There are things that are triangular in this world three sides, you draw a picture of a triangle on the board, but the idea of the triangle exists outside of the natural world too. There's the world of forms, there's the real world. And the world of the forms is the ideal or the perfect version of the things that exist here. Now, throughout the history of the philosophy, we're going to have a big debate about how we know those forms and how much of the forms are imprinted in your mind at birth and how much of them are accumulated through different things, but to really simplify Plato this morning, and of course, the one really small aspect of Plato, is the idea of forms. That there are things that exist in the real world, and then there are idealized things that, that exist outside the real world. Pay attention to that. So Augustine holds on to that, and he applies that to the theory of knowledge, of course. That there is a God who's outside of our world, man who's made in the image of God, right? In the image that's kind of, not directly cognate, but kind of like the form of God, is able then for, because he's made in the image of God, to have intelligibility of God's forms. And uh, so, make sense of it this way. If you have, as we've always gone through, the creator-creature distinction and the separated gulf, uh, the attributes of God, his om omnipotence, his all-power, his omniscience, his knowing everything, all these attributes of God, what makes God God, are so transcendent that they cannot be communicated to mankind and so how does the knowledge of these perfect forms get to mankind? It's impossible unless there is some type of form that God has pressed upon his creation 
uh, which we call the Imago Dei, or the image of God. And it's this being made in the image of God which makes these attributes of God communicable to the intellect of mankind. That's not strange. That's not strange. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's, a, there's a famous conversation with Charles Darwin when they asked Darwin, uh, I can't remember if it's a magazine article, some type of interview, they asked him if uh, he thought his reason was reliable, and he, Charles Darwin says, I believe my reason is reliable, even though he lives in a world of chance. But he doubts it because he does not, he's not sure if he can trust the reason of a higher order primate, like a monkey or an ape. <coughs> but in his worldview, not to say that Darwin believed that monkeys turned into humans, but that in his worldview, the idea of reason or the intellect was just a matter of evidence piled in his favor rather than an absolute case for intelligibility. But because we're made in the image of God, the intelligibility of God's incommunicable attributes are somehow put inside of who we are, whereas you wouldn't really trust the sensory impressions of any other animal. If your dog wanted to explain what color it was, he'd have a hard time, especially since he's missing the certain cones in his eyes to perceive certain colors. If you wanted to ask a chimp that spoke sign language about ethical issues, you'd have to weigh the ethical decisions of the monkey against some other standard. Yet, we somehow are told in the scripture that the image of God gives us a sense of God's law in our hearts, and so God's justice, God's power, God's all-knowing is given to mankind through this picture of his image uniquely. So the idea of communication of God is pressed upon here. Now, St. Paul explains in two ways that because Adam sinned, sin is entered into man, so this image has been marred. The noose, as we've discussed before, the mind of man is fallen. But more than that, man, even though he has the image of God in him and his conscience knows what's right and his heart has the law written on it, he suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. So God's communication to mankind of his attributes is suppressed by our sin. That's a difficult part. So holding on, holding on to that today, let's go fast forward a couple of centuries to our buddy Anselm. Now, anybody familiar, familiar, familiar with Anselm before today? Familiar. Good. I can make it whatever <coughs> I want then. No. A <laughs> uh, couple things to note about Anselm. Uh, Anselm is probably the greatest of the medieval philosophers who wrote the least. Uh, so, uh, something I need to learn. If there's power and brevity, uh, I don't know much about that yet. Uh, but Anselm, of course, uh, lived a mon monastic life, 11th century. For us as Anglicans, it's important to pay attention to Anselm because he was Anselm of Canterbury. This is probably the reason Roman Catholics really don't like him. Right? English bishop? No, I'm sorry. English uh, <laughs> authority? No. Uh, I have his book here. He has these really funny titles for his books. He has, the one we're going to pay attention to today is the Proslagion. And, of course, you all have a copy of this at home. But as you can see, these, both of these books, and including a reply to them, very small, right? This is, this is really tiny arguments. But Anselm is having intramural debates uh, between uh, him and his fellow monks uh, about the existence of God. And many times, Anselm's argument, often called the ontological argument, is seen as a proof for the existence of God, and that's not what the intention was back then. It's not, it's not they were doubting whether God exists, they were saying, how do we have certainty? Now, in traditional uh, Christian spirituality, we talk about scruples. Is it heard of scruples? Uh, scruples is an idea that Protestants are really good at understanding, because we've all heard the story of Martin Luther, how he turned in his bed at night, trying to find comfort from his sin, and you know, he had a problem with scruples. Right? Uh, am I really saved? Well, Anselm had a similar kind of tossing and turning about, he said, I know there's a God, and everybody knows there's a God, but how do we communicate the fact that we know that there's a God? Uh, and so the Proslogion is, the first chapter is really devotional. It's beautiful writing. It's great prose. Uh, it's almost like a, a devotional. But then he gets into the existence of God and how that 
is used, or uh, the argument for God's ontology is the argument for the existence of God at all. Now, uh, ontology is the idea of essence or being, and so the ontological argument is argument for the existence of God by the existence of God. Another circular reasoning, right? So ontology, ontology. We have to pay attention to words like essence because they show up in our in our creed. Um, one essence with the Father, something like that. I want to read you very shortly. You can see uh, the chapters in the Prasadhyana are just a couple of paragraphs, uh, but a little bit dense. But chapter three, it says uh, that he cannot thought not to exist. Would you love the double negatives there? Uh, he's talking about God. And he says, this being exists so truly that it cannot even be thought not to exist. Because God truly exists, he cannot be thought not to exist. That's begging the question a little bit. This is the greatest thinker of the 11th century. <laughs> he says, for it is possible to think that something exists that cannot be thought not to exist. And such a being is greater than one that cannot be thought to not exist. Therefore, if that which is greater cannot be thought can be thought not to exist, then that which is greater cannot be thought is not that which is greater cannot be thought. And this is a contradiction. So, you guys follow? <laughs> so, we talked about the forms. There's a world of real stuff, and there's a world of things we imagine, or things that exist outside the real stuff. So Anselm takes this idea, and he says, well, he doesn't use this example, we can use a different example. Let's use an example we all love. Uh, everybody can think of their favorite flavor of ice cream. And everybody says at the same time, pistachio. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was a stupid joke. But um, the, the, the idea is basically this. We got our ice cream. We got our little, nice, little one, nice little waffle cone, all that. Um, I've imagined the best flavor of ice cream, pistachio. But he says, you know what's greater than imagining the best ice cream? Actually having the real ice cream. Would you agree with that? So what's greater than the idea of ice cream? Physically having it. So if you imagine there's a greatest being, the greatest, most good, most holy, most benevolent, all those characteristics of the divine causality, if you can imagine those things, you will be better than that. The real thing existing. Therefore, God exists. Uh, this is a, a crazy uh, argument, but it's, it's how he makes the case. He says, so that that which a greater cannot even be thought exists so truly that it cannot even be thought not to exist. It's a strange, strange argument, and uh, our buddy Tommy Aquino, Thomas Aquinas, is not going to like it uh, in a few, <laughs> few, few centuries. Now, uh, he continues and says, And this to you, O Lord our God, you exist so truly, O Lord my God, that you cannot even be thought not to exist. And rightly so, for if some mind could think of something better than you, a creature would rise above the Creator and sit in judgment upon him, which is completely absurd. So, you know, you're taking these ideas in, in Greek and monistic metaphysics, and you're saying things like, okay, uh, infinity is impossible, but there is an eternal uncreated Creator and he creates creation, and if he creates a creation, then there must be something greater than creation that these real things in creation follow the forms of. So if we imagine the greatest form of something, then there has to be something greater than that form that it's modeled after, and that is God. And that's basically what Anselm is saying, is the fact that we can even come up with these forms proves that there's something these forms are after. And <clears throat> later, Aquinas will I take Aristotle's view on this and, and disagree with Anselm. But not for the reason that this is wrong, but because Anselm has another little, I mean, uh, Aquinas will add another piece to this conversation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? I hope so. I hope it makes sense. It might not. So, <clears throat> the question then, uh, well, uh, I probably should before I go there, uh, not everybody agreed with Anselm, even in his own monastery or even in his own time. And so, one of the replies from him was by a man named Guanilo, Guanilo. and uh, Guanilo says, Anselm, if this was true, then you could do that with anything. You could say, I imagine the best island 
And the best island has this perfect climate and has all the best animals and all the best wildlife. Therefore, if I can imagine the best island in my mind, that island must really exist. And Aquinas says, no, you fool. <laughs> says, uh, I mean, Aquinas, Anselm says, no, you fool. Uh, this only applies to necessary, to necessary beginnings. So it doesn't, presuppositionalism isn't that whatever I believe is true is true because I imagine it's true. It says that in this complex version, or this, uh, this uh, basis for intelligibility, that there are certain things that must be assumed for everything to follow in order. So you can't start at the end of the, of the rope and say, uh, I'm going to pull myself up. The rope has to be tied to something. And so Anselm was saying, if the rope is tied to an eternal God who creates out of nothing, okay, so he's a necessary beginning, if that's true, then at the end of the rope we can pull on it because we can assume it's tied to something. And, and so that's how his argument basically works. And our later philosophers will take his argument and apply it to what is it tied to. And so I'm going to read to you uh, from Ventil. How are we doing on time? Sorry. 10.17. 10.17. we got three minutes. So three minutes to go for the next <coughs> thousand years of philosophical history. No, uh, easily manageable. No, uh, so Ventil, Ventil says, because uh, we still have this issue of, uh, we have the ont ontology of God meaning what God is. But isn't there a debate over what kind of God is God? Right? Uh, our liberal friends will say God is love, therefore he can't hate homosexuals, and he can't hate thieves, and he can't hate sinners. Right? So there's a, dis there's a disagreement on ontology. Um, and there's also these, these kind of objections that even came in the time of Anselm. Well, if, if God is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-good, how does evil exist in the world if an all-knowing, all-powerful good? Couldn't he stop evil? And if he knows all things, doesn't he know preconditions for the fall? So those, those type of, of ideas are there too. But most importantly is the idea of how this knowledge, of course, is passed to mankind. Uh, and so the, the argument Van Til makes is he says, uh, this is from Defense of the Faith, says, God's sovereignty refers to the fact that there is no other ultimate power beside himself and that his holy plan for the world will prevail over all opposition against it. So how do we define who God is using Anselm's idea? Is God is the all-powerful source and beginning superintendent of all of creation. And so if that's your predicate starting point, then everything else has to fall in line your theory of justice, your theory of evil, your theory of good, all of those discussions about theodicy have to point back to, does it comport with the primary objective, and that is that God is sovereign. So therefore, Van Til says, the incommunicable attributes of God stress his transcendence, and the communicable attributes stress his imminence. So transcendence meaning God's otherness, his imminence, his nearness. Uh, the two imply one another. A Christian notion of transcendence and Christian notion of imminence go together. This is why we believe in the doctrine of incarnation, because God, who is other than creation, took on flesh, which is part of the creation. So the imminence and transcendence come to us in the doctrine of the creation. So hold on to that for, for a second, and hold on to that the idea of the image of God is how God communicates his attributes. And we're going to go over to uh, Dr. Bonson's book, if you want to turn with me, you can. We're going to start at page, uh, well, chapter 18, which is on page 77. So he has a couple of, of uh, arguments or ideas to work through. So having in your mind uh, this kind of development, there's a historical progression to the apologetic method of providing a, a basis for intelligibility, a basis for reasoning. Uh, on page 77, Bonson begins with, the nature of the apologetic situation. It says, the controversy between the believer and unbeliever is in principle an antithesis between two complete systems of thought involving ultimate commitments and assumptions. Ultimate commitment and assumptions. So uh, the idea here is either God is sovereign or man is sovereign. God's a source of truth or there's a, some other idea that can be used to 
apply against God to judge God, as we've said in previous ones. Is God under trial, or is God under the dock, or is God the source of standards? Number two says, even laws of thought and method, along with factual evidence, will be accepted and evaluated in light of one's governing presuppositions. So the illustration we began with this morning with the tortoise versus Achilles, initially you thought, of course Achilles will win. But then, if you apply a different set of, uh, of tools to, uh, to describe it, you find maybe you can't prove you know what you know you know. And the same thing will be true here. It's not arguing individual facts, it's arguing where you start from. Number three says, all chains of argumentation, especially over matters of ultimate personal importance, track back and depend upon starting points which are taken to be self-evidencing. Thus, circularity in debate will be unavoidable. However, not all circles are intelligible or valid. Right? So everything has to go back to a starting point. But the question in the debate in our modern sense is, is the circle man's reason, or does the circle begin with God? Um, and so as we look through the history of philosophy, we'll see the problem with beginning with man's reason initially is man's reason is darkened by the fall, so it's not perfect. Um, so other solutions will be offered through philosophical history to how man's reason can operate, uh, because reason, of course, is a tool, not, not an exterior thing. Uh, but things like empiricists will say reason through investigation, so we consider the scientific evidence, and we evaluate it, and we can develop patterns. Well, that's not sufficient, is what um, uh, Bonson will say, but it is self-circular. We know something is true because we observed it with our eyes, and we know that those observations are true because we trust our eyes, right? Circular uh, senses of, of authority. It says, thus, appeals to logic, fact and personality may be necessary, but they are not apologetically adequate, which is needed. What is needed is not piecemeal replies, probabilities, or isolated evidences, but rather an attack upon the underlying presupposition of the unbeliever's system of thought. So, to close this morning, the unbeliever's way of thinking is characterized as follows. A. By nature, the unbeliever is in the image of God, and therefore inescapably religious. His heart testifies continually, as does the clear revelation of God around him to, the, to God's existence and character. Sometimes presuppositionalists are accused of denying natural law. We recognize natural revelation. The entire cosmos is, as Jesus is saying, the rocks are crying out for the existence of God. Everything that exists points naturally to God. But for some reason it's insufficient because faith must be awakened by the Holy Spirit uh, and we're suppressing that truth. The natural truth is around us, but it's insufficient to bring us to knowledge of God uh, because of these, this fallen nature. B says the unbeliever exchanges truth for a lie. He is a fool who refuses to begin his thinking with reverence for the Lord. Right? These are scripture ideas. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's from the book of Proverbs. Right? <clears throat> uh, says, he will not build upon Christ's self-evidencing -evident words and suppresses the unavoidable revelation of God in nature. So this is how St. Paul can say that man is without excuse. Why everybody is held accountable for their sins, even though not everybody is told the gospel. It's because nature itself is evidence. Your heart is given this evidence. Because you're made in the image of God, everybody has enough evidence, but they suppress it. Uh, now, C says, because he delights not in understanding, but chooses to serve the creature rather than the creator, the unbeliever is self-confidently committed to his own ways of thought, being convinced that he could not be fundamentally wrong. He flaunts perverse thinking and challenges the self-attesting word of God. This is the illustration I used a few weeks ago, where you're getting robbed by somebody with a gun, and you say, oh, I'm not worried about that, I don't believe in guns. Right? The same thing happens here with those who refuse to believe the scripture. Refusing to believe the scripture doesn't make the scripture not true. It just makes you a fool for not believing it. Uh, D says, consequently, the <coughs> unbeliever's thinking results in ignorance. In his dark and futile mind, he actually hates knowledge and can gain only a knowledge falsely so called. So uh, sometimes the other caricature of presuppositionalism is that we say, because God is a source of knowledge, therefore the unbeliever can know nothing. Well, that can't possibly be true because unbelievers do math. Unbelievers do science, unbelievers do philosophy. The answer is not that the unbelieving mind can't hold any facts. They can't give an account for why what they know is true. 
They can't give a justification at the base of it why there's an ordered universe, why there is no law of contradiction, because there is a law of non-contradiction. They don't give an, an example for why. And the philosophical or the epistemological base for all of knowledge is rested upon these ideas we've discussed today. There is an eternal God who exists outside of creation, who has created creation out of nothing, and therefore has put on it a logical imprint in the creation that then is discoverable by man because he has communicated his forms into mankind. Does that make sense? So the unbeliever can say, oh look, 2 plus 2 equals 4, but he can't tell you why. He can say, gravity falls at this speed. He can say these things. He can do math. He can do these things, but he can't explain why unless he operates in a worldview that presupposes the existence of God in a logical uh, universe. So E says, to the extent that he actually knows anything, it is due to his unacknowledged dependence upon the supposed truth about God within him. This renders the unbeliever, unbeliever intellectually schizophrenic, meaning <clears throat> he says one thing, but he behaves uh, oppositely, right? So he says there's no way to know truth, but then says that emphatically, right? I don't believe in truth. Well, do you believe that or you don't believe that? Uh, or logic is not universal. Well, does that apply to this conversation too, right? So uh, in order for it to have any conversation of knowledge or intelligibility, you have to presuppose the ground rules. Otherwise, there is no basis for having any knowledge. Therefore, there is no point in having these discussions because if the law of non-contradiction cannot be first presumed, then we can all believe whatever we want. It could all be relative. So <clears throat> he says, this renders the unbeliever intellectually schizophrenic. By his espoused way of thinking, he actually opposes himself and shows a need for radical change of mind onto the general knowledge of truth. Finally, his last two points say, the unbeliever's ignorance is culpable, and he's responsible for it, because he is without excuse for his rebellion against God's revelation. Hence, he is without an apologetic for his own thoughts. And finally, his belief does not stem from a lack of factual evidence. I would only believe if I had enough evidence but from a refusal to submit to the author authoritative word of God from the beginning of his thinking. So next we're going to go over the next couple of steps of uh, how Anselm came into conflict with Aquinas and how we have a divergence of philosophical thought between the medieval thinkers and how the Reformation is built upon the Anselmian, Augustinian tradition of knowledge and how as great as Aquinas is here on epistemology, he has taken Aristotle's view and has created many of the errors we see um, in the you know, Semi-Pelagian churches. Uh, but with that, uh, that will be sufficient this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.